Do Christians and Muslims worship the same God? Should Christians be reaching out to Muslims seeking spiritual reconciliation with them? Should Christians and Muslims be holding joint worship services? Is the sacred book of Islam, the Quran, equal in authority to the Bible? Should Christians and Muslims seek to merge their religions into a new religion called Chrislam? Stay tuned for a discussion with an expert on these issues. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents... Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end-time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have a very special guest with us this week, one of our favorite guests. His name is Eric Barger, and he is the founder and director of a ministry called Take a Stand. Eric, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. It is always a joy and a blessing to have you on this program. Thank you, David. I'm glad to be here with you again. Tell us, how in the world did you ever come up with an unusual name like Take a Stand Ministry. Well, it's time for the church to do that. We saw a lot of people that were waffling on a lot of things. And since our ministry is about discernment and and apologetics, we just felt like that take a stand was something we were saying. Take a stand on the scriptures, on the Lord Jesus. And that's that's what we stand for. And I know from my own experience that a lot of that waffling has to do with the fact that people just don't really know why they believe what they believe. And that's what your ministry helps with. It is. And I think that that lends to the the lack of of sound doctrinal teaching that we see going on. We see a lot of self-help sermons going on, but not a lot of sound doctrine. And the church needs to know the doctrines of the faith. Yeah. What did, you said apologetics. Could you explain to our viewing audience exactly what apologetics is? Do you sure. go around apologizing to people? I, um, I only apologize when needed. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apologetics is a Bible school term for the defense of the faith. It comes from the Greek word apologia, and that and giving an, ab, an ample defense of what you believe. And that's what we're doing. Well, there's this new ecumenical movement that our folks have been writing and asking us to talk about. It's this, the idea where we blend Islam with Christianity, it's called Chrislam. And folks have been writing and saying, can we do a show on, on Chrislam? And you're here. So right. define it for and us. And I want to underline that incidentally because he yeah. really has. He's just been overwhelmed with requests. It's, it seems like people are really becoming aware of this and they're saying, what is it? What is it? And so we're so delighted to have you here to tell us what it is. Well, yeah. well, I'm glad to be here to do this. <laughs> and, and you've been speaking on it a lot, right? Uh, I have been. I've done a DVD on it and we've been speaking on it. It's one of my most requested seminars now. And uh, hmm. this is something we need to talk okay, about. Okay. So as Nathan said, what is it? Okay. Where Okay. come from? Chrislam is the, the blending of Christianity and Islam. It came from Nigeria. It's less than 30 years old. From Nigeria? Yeah. An imam and a Christian pastor who were at war with each other, literally having a type of civil war, laid down their guns. Good idea. But uh, when they did, they started looking at what they had in common. And in the case of the Christian pastor, uh, he didn't examine what they could never have in common because they base it around the idea that Allah is Jehovah and the Isa or Jesus mentioned 97 times in the Quran is the Jesus of the Bible. But I think a clear uh, a view of the two, when you begin to understand it, you begin to see that Isa is not Jesus and Allah is not Jehovah. And I believe every Muslim imam knows that, but they love the mileage they get out of it with the Christians who think we're being conciliatory or, or kind somehow by saying that uh, we all worship the same God. Now you say they started in Nigeria, but it spread from there, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but this imam and pastor are traveling the world now, oh, right? uh, talking about the joys of Chrislam and how we can have joint services where we read the Quran and the Bible side by side. Well, didn't we actually have a Chrislam Sunday here in the United States recently? June 26th of uh, 2011 was Chrislam Sunday. What uh, does that mean? Several hundred churches brought a Muslim uh, leader or cleric in, and they read the Quran and the Bible side by side. In the churches? Christian churches, yeah. or churches that at least used to be. What about the mosques? Were they? Uh, there wasn't any mosques of involved. Not. No, only the churches. That's right. Now understand that Christianity is what suffers when you begin to look at these sure. two religions, because no imam is going to bring a Bible into his mosque and read it from from the pulpit, or allow a Christian to come in and talk about Jesus. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, they'll talk about Jesus, but not the. Not the but biblical Jesus. But not the yeah, they're not gonna let them talk about the biblical Jesus. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. The the Jesus of the Quran is a prophet and uh, I think that everybody needs to understand that the Quran teaches that uh, the Jesus of the Quran is going to be uh, Allah's enforcer to eventually force everyone to become Muslim. This isn't the Jesus of the Bible. So we're going to invite uh, false teachers to come into the church simply because we want to show them that we love them and that we respect them and we care for them. 
we come a long way from the times of Elijah, haven't we? We have. <laughs> now, look, I, I would go anywhere, and I, I've been criticized for this. I would go and preach in the, the, in the presence of the cultists if I could. I'd be misunderstood for doing so, but I believe that's where we're supposed to take the truth. Yeah. But in this case, this is a, this is a, a promotion of Islam uh, saying that it's equal to Christianity, that both paths lead to God. It's a, it's a form of limited universalism. Here's a quote from John Ashbrook. A debate is a conflict which clarifies a position. A dialogue is a conversation which compromises a position. Wow. I think the folks with DVR are going to play that back several times. That's a powerful quote. Well, we're going to talk about dialogue that's going on that started at Yale University and, and what, what's meant when we get together for this dialogue. Right. It's not to uh, talk about differences. It's to talk about where can we say that we agree. Right. And let's forget about the distance, yeah. differences. Okay. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview of uh, Eric Barger. We're talking about Chrislam. Nathan, kick it off. Well, Eric, soon after 9-11, we had this, you know, we had to deal with Islam, whether it had to do with terrorism and whatnot. And George W. Bush came out and he said, well, we need to have peace with our brothers because their God is our God. Is the Christian God and the Muslim God are one and the same. Is that true? No, that's not true. Uh, however, that was a political statement. And uh, if, mm. if indeed... Uh, President Bush is a Christian, and I'll, I'll give him that much. If, if indeed he is, um, I don't think he understands that the differences are there. And, and there's a lot of, uh, of, of people in the church that are confused about this. We see Christian leaders, uh, some evangelicals, who are saying that Allah and Jehovah are the same by what they, by, by the different uh, actions they're taking, by the things they're saying. So no wonder there's that confusion. And certainly as a political statement by, by President Bush, he has to be the president for all the people, including those who are Muslims here. Well, who is Allah then to the Muslims? I mean, if he's not Jehovah God, then how is he different from the God, okay. Jehovah God? There were over 300 mm -hmm. different gods being worshipped around the Kaaba back in the 7th century. And the Kaaba is their... The, the Kaaba there. It, the Kaaba stone and the Kaaba monument is there. That's a meeting. Meteor, right? that it's they a worship? meteor, exactly, okay. and they believe that their God lives there. This is why Muslims pray toward Mecca, wherever they are in the world, and do it five times a day at least. And um, um, that being the case, that uh, uh, there were all these different gods and idols being worshipped, Muhammad uh, took it upon himself as the political, spiritual, and military leader of his tribe. He believed he had a vision from the angel Gabriel while he was in a trance state in a cave. It's always Gabriel, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and that, uh, that he was to bring pure religion back to the world. And so he, by the sword, went about either converting people, either they'd come to his viewpoint or it was off of their heads kind of thing. And, and we see yeah. this all through history. So he took it upon himself to bring his God to bear upon the world. And his God, although the word Allah means God in Arabic, and we could, if we were Arabic speakers, we might use the word Allah if we were uh, referring to God. There's got to be a clear delineation by Christians in the day we live in to discern between Jehovah and Allah and the Isa, or Jesus of the Quran, and Jesus Christ of the Bible, who is God incarnate. So, now, was Allah the moon god, particularly? Allah, Allah was the moon god. Okay, so he wasn't the overall god, all-powerful, he was just god of the, the moon. He was the god of the Koresh tribe, who was Muhammad's tribe. Okay. He decided in the cave that, uh, that Gabriel had shown him that his way was the only way. His religion was the right way, and there wasn't any other way. Well, let's go back to Nathan's original question, though. Uh, Islam is a monotheistic religion, worshiping, they say, the one and only true God. Right. Christianity is a monotheistic religion. So if they both worship the one and only true God, don't they both worship the same God? They're not worshiping the same God. All right. Now, how are they different? Okay. Jehovah God, as shown to us in the Bible, to the Jews and then to the Christians, is different than the God of, of Islam. Islam worships the God that Muhammad's tribe worshiped, who is the core. Yeah, but how tribe. is he different in nature? Well, if you read the Quran and the Bible side by side, you see that either uh, it, that God must be schizophrenic if he came up with both <laughs> those books because they do not read the same. And in the uh, in the DVD on this, in my teaching For example, on this, example, uh, the Quran never mentions uh, uh, Allah as a God of love. No, never, ever, never. And the Jesus of the Quran is but a prophet; he is not God incarnate. Uh, it says that God had no son. I think the greatest refutation of of uh, Islam is from the Quran in, in Surah chapter four. In the Quran, clearly says that Christians should never speak the word Trinity, and that we 
should understand that Allah never had a son. Right. So uh, Islam rejects the very idea of the Trinity. They reject the idea that God ever had a son. They reject the idea that Jesus was crucified on the cross. They say it was an imposter there. That's right. That he was never resurrected from the dead. And yet, if you were to invite an Islamic imam to come to your congregation and talk about Jesus, he would get up and talk about how much they love Jesus and how Jesus is mentioned in their scriptures. Right. And you would think that, because he's not going to tell you that they don't believe the things that we believe about Jesus. That's so right. It's, it's very, very misleading. Yeah, it, it is. And, and they, they believe that, that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. I mean, this is all the Quran. Yeah. But at the same token, they, they never deify Jesus. He is not deity. He is not God. This is a different Jesus. And the Apostle Paul warns us, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, about different Jesuses, different Gospels, and different spirits that will come along. And it's our responsibility to know what we believe, that when these other religious systems come along that mention a Jesus, that we're able to discern whether they're talking about the real one or the imposters. So we're talking about really two different gods here. Uh, we I mean, are. For example, the God of Islam is an arbitrary God. He is so arbitrary that even... Mohammed said he didn't know for sure whether he was saved or not. That's because right. Because it's just going to depend at the last judgment whether God saves you or not. And you don't never know. And about the only hope you have is maybe to die fighting for Islam. Well, well that's well, an excellent point. Then. Their salvation is totally different, right? There then is. There's... Exactly. And that's what I was going to say, that, that uh, martyrdom is the only way out. Uh, if you've done too many bad things, you don't know if you make it. Even if you followed the five pillars of Islam, the legalism of Islam, uh, they have uh, what's called recording angels, one that writes down all the good stuff you do, <laughs> And one that writes down all the bad stuff hey, you don't do. Point this way. But yeah, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, but if if um, if the one writing down the bad stuff overpowers or has more on his ledger than the one that writes down the good stuff, well, you don't know if there's a way out except for martyrdom. And that's wow. tragic. You uh, mentioned to me uh, in in a previous conversation something about the insiders movement. What in the world is that? Well, the insiders movement is a movement inside Islam that says if you come to, to faith in Jesus uh, while you're a Muslim, just stay there. It's too much trouble. You'll lose your family. You might lose your life. You know, don't stand against uh, Islam inside of it. Just stay there. Do the five pillars of Islam. Do the five prayers. Keep reading the Quran. Go to the mosque. Listen to the imam. But where is coming out from among them and being you separate is the problem. That's like, uh, that's, that, that's like saying, uh, well, I know that you're worshiping Baal, but you can go ahead and do that, that and, that's and, what it, and worship. Just add Jesus as one of your gods. That, that's really what it comes down to. And tragically, there are people all through Christianity, including some who claim to be evangelicals, who are advocating this kind of thing. There's books that have been written that are, that are uh, helping to substantiate the idea of the insider's movement. You know, one thing that people do not understand about Islam is the principle of abrogation. Um, this, uh, uh, the Quran was written over a long period of time, and when it first, the very earliest statements in there about Christians and Jews are very positive. These are people of the book. Uh, we should seek unity with them and all this sort of thing. Right. Later on, when they didn't accept what Muhammad had, then he had new revelations from God that we were to kill these people and subdue these people and all that. And that overrides the earlier revelations. Right. The principle of abrogation. We don't have that in God's Word. I mean, God doesn't change His mind. That, but in the, right. in, in the Quran, He changes His mind. So I've noticed that in Western uh, cultures like America, when Muslims quote the Quran, they quote the early scriptures which have been abrogated, and they know that. But then when they get into control, they suddenly switch the scriptures that talk about put them under subjection. Mm -hmm. What do mm -hmm. these leaders who want to join with Islam do with verses like uh, Surah 9-5, which is the Quran's version, chapter 9-5? So when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Right. Take them captives, besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Or Surah 2, 191 through 193, kill them wherever you find them. And then if you go to the Hadith, which is the collection of uh, Muhammad's sayings, and the last hour would come, not unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews, and the Muslims will kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree, and a stone or a tree would say, Muslim or the servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Uh, what do we do with these I verses? know, I know. I mean, they're just outright kill everybody unless you're a Muslim. A and especially those who stand against it. Yes. I mean, and that's said over and over, the cutting off of the right hand and the left foot is one of the punishments, if not execution. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the, the Quran teaches. But again, 
Let's come back to what it says. I, I, Surah 9 uh, is a great example of that. Uh, and it's there's, one of the later ones, right, Dave, that you had talked about? It's, well, the Quran, remember, yeah. as it was written, uh, they begin to compilate it 18 years after Muhammad's yeah. death. So mm-hmm. it's not Muhammad actually writing it. They're writing down what he taught and what okay. the, the followers. It says in, uh, in uh, Surah chapter 4, O people of the book, that's talking about us Christians, Commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of Allah but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more an apostle of Allah, and his word which he bestowed on Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. It says, So say not Trinity, detest, for it will be better for you. For Allah is one Allah, glory be to him above having a son. It says clearly he didn't have a son. This is not a religion that Christians can join hands with. And when when we have people like the Yale Divinity School that we've talked about uh, reaching out, and they base their premise in the paper that they wrote that many high-profile Christian leaders have signed, they base their premise on the idea that we all worship the same God. If we do, then our God is a very confused God who has said one thing to one people and another thing to another people. The God of the Quran is not the God of the Bible. Absolutely Point not. Point blank. I yes. mean, it's just not. And anyone who thinks he is, is deceived. Yes, <laughs> I'm afraid so. That's exactly right. And yet we have Christian leaders all around us saying, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's for world peace. I mean, that's going to be the cry. It's for world peace, you know. It's for the damnation of people's souls. All we do is assure that Muslims who listen to this kind of thing or people who get involved in the insiders movement, which is really Chrislam inside Islam, or in Chrislam, in Christian circles, all we're assuring is that they're going to have a convolution of who God is and never a clear picture of salvation through the blood of Jesus. Welcome back to our discussion of Chrislam with Eric Barger, the founder and director of Take a Stand Ministries. Eric, how about telling our viewers how they can get in touch with your ministry and also how they might be able to get a copy of this new DVD you have just produced called The Deception of Chrislam. Thank you, David. Uh, if people want more information about us, they can contact us at our, our website, ericbarger.com, E-R-I-C-B-A-R-G-E-R, ericbarger.com, or call us at 214-289-5244. Both the uh, Deception of Chrislam DVD, which is a brand new one, and also the Truth About Islam DVD, both those will be helpful to you along these lines of discussion we're having today. And there's lots of articles and information on our website that deals with this and a lot of other areas in apologetics. Eric, do you put out a newsletter? I do. We do a newsletter. We do it six times a, a year through the mail, and then we do it about every other week through email. And we'd love to, to uh, send you also our newsletter and a free packet of information if you'll sign up at our, at our website or just call our phone number. Is the newsletter free of charge? It's free of charge. Well, folks, Thank you, you, David. <laughs> you can't beat that. I mean, okay. Nathan, how about you telling uh, our, our viewers about our website? site and some of the features on it. Certainly. Well, after visiting ericbarger.com, come to lamblion.com, L-A-M-B-L-I-O-N.com. And uh, we have tons of articles, uh, TV shows like Christ and Prophecy. You can watch this right on there. Uh, we have a newsletter that comes out every other week. You can sign up for it right on the homepage. We have a blog if you need a daily dose of Bible prophecy. And we have a Facebook group. There's thousands of people there talking and sharing about Bible prophecy every day. Thank you, Nathan. I hope people will do that. I tell you, that's an exciting website. I congratulate you on how you keep it changing all the time. Praise and, the Lord. And especially your blog and, and all the things that go on there. That's a very interesting and exciting. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, Eric, let's get back to our discussion of Chrislam. Great. Uh, in my research on this, I discovered that there was a major Muslim Christian dialogue uh, that was held in 2008 and sponsored by the Yale Divinity School. And it produced a document that many major Christian leaders have signed, including evangelicals. Uh, uh, and it basically talks about the fact that uh, there are many uh, uh, things that are common between Islam and Christianity and that we ought to focus on those and not the differences. And the two things that they single out and really focus on are love of God and love of neighbor. And they said this is characteristic of both, of both Christ, uh, Christianity and Islam. Your right. reaction. Right. Well, first of all, it's a different God. <laughs> that, I mean, we've already gone through that, but I've got to reiterate that for anyone who just tuned in. This is a different God. Mm-hmm. And I know it sounds like that, that we're being stick in the mud and, and isolationists and so on, but I don't see any reason why I should, should give any credence or try to be friendly to a religion who has done one thing to every person who has ever followed it. 
and that is people lose their soul by following it. Yeah. Why should I be kind to it? Yet uh, with the Yale Divinity School and some of the usual suspects that we see, both the squishy evangelicals and also those in liberal circles. Like that term. Well, that's really what it is. You know, people who really don't, uh, they kind of go along, really don't know what they believe. They want everybody to like them. Exactly. Let's all be, uh, you know, one big happy family, all be friends and so on. Uh, they talk about uh, the love of God, love of neighbor. But, you know, in Islam, they tell you that unless you convert to Islam, you're still a member of the house of war. You're either a member of the house of peace, you become a Muslim, or you're a member of the house of war. That's the infidels. That's everyone else. There's no live in, live in Islam. This is a Christian's idea of how we can somehow uh, join hands with Muslims, but yet we do so based on the idea that they worship the same God we do, and, and that's just simply not the case. You know, uh, Eric, when I see these Christian Islam dialogues going on, knowing what I know about Islam, I've got to believe that the Muslim leaders must laugh all the way home after it's over with. Uh, I've said exactly the same thing, David. <laughs> I've said the exact same thing. Can, can I tell you, there's the other little dirty secret here is that you find out that the people who are signing documents, like the Yale Divinity mm -hmm. School document, and I've got a, a long article on our website about this. The links all to the article or go back to the Yale Divinity School. People can read the original documents. But the dirty little secret is these folks are pushing for a Palestinian state and they're anti-Israel. And that is the thing. It's replacement theology. It's dominionism. And you begin to, tr tr to trace down the, uh, the roots of it. And then it comes back to what they believe about eschatology and, and, uh, and Israel as a state. Well, the thing that gets me is how people talk about uh, tr uh, Islam as a, as a religion of peace and tolerance and all this. And yet there is not a mosque that's going to allow a Christian to speak in the mosque. There is not a mosque that's going to have one of these dialogues held in a mosque. Yeah. Uh, there is not an Islamic country in the world where there's any freedom of religion. You're either a, a Muslim or you're going to be dead, one of the two. And yet they talk about this as religion of peace. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabian government put out a book that was for uh, high school and junior high school students here aimed at United States students. And that book said that all across the Muslim world that, that other houses of worship had flourished and they welcomed it. That's simply not true. Yeah. Our soldiers came and bring a New Testament with them when, right. they, uh, when they go over to try to, to help one of those countries to overthrow a dictator or whatever. Well, if Islam started around 600 A.D., so it's been around 1,400 years, does its history show that it flourishes with Christianity? Or how does it treat Christianity throughout the centuries? No, and it's certainly the, the saints who have been martyred along the way because they rejected Islam. I mean, Madonna... Mm. Uh, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it was close. Muhammad went to Medina, you know, and he, he forced the Jews and Christians to either accept Islam or die. And they, they died. They were martyred. Well, along that line, uh, several years ago, we did an interview with Mark Gabriel and produced this album called The Mark Gabriel Story. Mark Gabriel's a re remarkable man. Uh, he grew up in Cairo, and he had the whole uh, Quran memorized by the age of 12. Now, that's remarkable because the Quran is, they don't allow it to be translated in modern Arabic. Right. So it's got, he didn't even know what he was saying. He just had the sounds. And then he became the second number two in his class of almost uh, 3,000 at the Al Hazar University there in uh, Cairo. And then he became the professor of Islamic history at the university there and an imam at, the, at Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that looking back on Islamic history, he could sum it up in one sentence. The history of Islam is a river of blood. Well, that's, that's Every a, place exactly. it is advanced, it is advanced with the sword, yeah. not through conversions, but through the sword. Yeah. And it keeps people under control with the sword. I think the the uh, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and what's called the Arab Spring uh, is really bad news for Muslims who are trying to hide where Islam is coming from. And you know, we, we it, this is not a hate campaign about Muslims. Mm. This is about trying to dialogue to, with them about who the real God is, about who the real Jesus is. Uh, if that's what the Yale Divinity School was doing and all these, as I call them, squishy evangelicals who were signing these documents, I'd be all for it. This is not where they're going with this, though. This is not the goal of it. Uh, our goal here is to define the differences, the stark differences between Islam and Christianity and show how they can't be brought together. But our, our real, our heart desire is to see the Muslims be saved. Incidentally, this sort of thing is going on in other areas. We recently had a Christian-Mormon dialogue in Salt Lake City where some major evangelicals went out there and they hugged on each other and even got up and apologized for persecution of Mormonism. And they don't point out any difference. They don't point out that they're going to hell. Yeah. 
Now, that, that happened in 2004, and may I say the guy who did that at the Salt Lake City Temple also signed the Yale Divinity School document uh, saying that Muslims and Christians are, are uh, on the same path with the same God. Eric, all throughout Europe, people are giving up their Christianity, they went to secularism, and now mosques are flourishing, people mm-hmm. are joining Islam like crazy. Why are people converting to Islam so much in Europe? You know, it might be out of pressure, uh, it might be out of deception, Certainly, we're in the end of the end times. And when you see everything, all the forces of the world being rallied together against Israel, I have to think this, this, is, this is part of what's going on. At this point in time, we're watching these events. You know, I, I think people, uh, we are all born with a spiritual hunger. That's part of our, uh, we're born with a, an emptiness that needs to be filled spiritually. Right. And in Europe, Christianity is dead because Christianity is sold out. And Christianity sold out to humanism and, and uh, began to teach that the Bible is not the Word of God, but the Bible is man's search for God and full of myth, legend, and superstition. People stopped going to church. The Anglican churches of England are empty today. Only 5% of the people in England even bother to go to church anymore because there's nothing there. And yet there's still that spiritual hunger. And I think people look at Islam and they see people who are dedicated, committed, believe in what, and, and, and that's, they're looking for something to believe in. Yeah, you're exactly right. It has been part of the failure, uh, or it, should I say, it is the failure of the church that has caused some of this or opened these doors. This is why the cults are thriving. This is why we have kids who are, who are floating around in the emergent church movement that have no idea about the blood of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, salvation by grace. They're not hearing those doctrines. We need the doctrines of the faith to be taught by our pastors, wherever they are. So, let's put our place, uh, ourselves in the place of our viewers for a moment. If the pastor of one of their churches suddenly announces that next Sunday we're going to reach out to Muslims and because we're going to invite one of the imams to come to our church and speak to us, what should they do? Well, that was what was suggested by a conference at Yale in 2008 that pastors should do this. And large evangelical churches, mega churches, have done that kind of thing. What should people do? Protest with all your heart. Warn everybody you can. It isn't that we're being unloving to the Muslims. It's that this religion has no place inside the Christian church and should be exposed for what it is. And pray that their pastor would be delivered from spiritual deception. Exactly. Eric, I want to thank you for being with us this uh, week. As I said at the beginning of the program, you've been on this program many times, and it's always a joy and a blessing to have you with us. Well, it's, it's great to be here, and I'm, I'm just uh, blessed to do it. Thank you. Well, amen. Hey, you should come back next week, because <laughs> <Okay>. we really, <laughs> another show that people want to know is, how do you deal with atheists? After all, atheists have really increased their attacks on Christianity right. and the Bible. Right. Would you mind coming back I, and talking about to. that? That's, that's a topic that needs to be talked about. Yeah, they're, right. they're getting very aggressive. Well, uh, Eric, uh, thanks so much, and we'll look forward to seeing you back here next week. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan together with Nathan Jones saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Are you interested in learning more about Islam? Then get your copy of the DVD, The Mark Gabriel Story. Mark is a former professor of Islamic history at Al Hazar University in Cairo, Egypt, the world's premier Islamic university. He also served as an imam of a mosque in Cairo. This video contains the remarkable story of how he came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior and how his acceptance of Jesus almost resulted in the loss of his life before he was forced to flee from Egypt to South Africa and then on to the United States. This best-selling author will help you better understand the true nature of Islam. Call the number you see on the screen or go to lamblion.com and order the Mark Gabriel story for a gift of $12 or more plus the cost of shipping. The running time of this video is 52 minutes. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.